now we move on to the services of reply to the association itself. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Mr. Jeremy Tolding, who was headmaster uh, from 96 to 2001. Indeed, in my first, uh, my final year, sorry, coincided with his first year as headmaster. So obviously, I gave him a few notes in the right direction, a few words. In the most humble spirit, I can muster. Please join me in welcoming a personal friend of the OHA and a wonderful headmaster. Jeremy Gold. Well now, Andrew, you have not done quite what I suggested you might do. In fact, you never did what I did. <laughs> <laughs> President, Master, ladies, gentlemen. I need to reveal at this point, otherwise the opening words of my little offering to you will fall on stony ground. Um, I need to reveal the fact that somebody else was due to address you at this particular point this evening. Uh, I was not the first choice. <laughs> and Andrew was going to explain that uh, and, and, and allow you to understand exactly what happened to the invitation of me to be with you this evening. But when John Coral did kindly contact me uh, not so very long ago uh, to ask me to speak this evening, not so very long ago at all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> My mind went, as would of yours, to that remarkable corpus in the canon of English literature, the output. I speak of P.G. Woodhouse. And the moment when Bertie Wooster was asked by his Aunt Dahlia to be a stand-in, a substitute, to present the prizes and to speak at the prize giving at Upton Snodbury Grammar School, of which she, Aunt Dahlia, was a governor. Aunt Dahlia, rather as John Coral, had clearly trawled the kingdom <laughs> in search of a suitable for the prize giving guest of honour. But once Aunt Dahlia's invited guest had had to withdraw, her efforts had come to naught in the search, hence her approach to Bertie. Now, his immediate response was one of disbelief that she should have approached him. Protestation on his part on the same score. But Aunt Dahlia, as John Coral, was having none of it. The text reads, I, Bertie, began to feel like some wild thing caught in a snare. But why, Aunt, why? Do you want me? I mean, what am I? Ask yourself that. I often have. <laughs> I mean to say, Aunt Dahlia, I'm not the type. You have to be some terrifically important person to give away prizes. I seem to remember when I was at school, it was generally a prime minister or somebody like that. Oh, but that was at Eton. <laughs> <laughs> At Market Snodsbury, we aren't nearly so choosy. <laughs> well, even though, ladies and gentlemen, the haberdashers uh, uh, is a far cry from Upton Snodsbury Grammar School, and even though, as you may have detected, there is an obvious parallel between Bertie's situation and mine, I should like to say, from the bottom of my heart, how delighted and how honoured I feel to be with you this evening, <laughs> albeit by chance. Up to 15 minutes, there's another part of the correspondence with John Cole, up to 15 minutes to play with. 15, 7 to 15. I, I imagine you might wish me to probe one or two educational themes this evening. I presume I'm right in that assumption. <laughs> Maybe I'm not. In order to get started, though, let us turn to the genius of Oscar Wilde and to the piercing educational observation of one of his great creations, Lady Bracknell, in the importance of being earnest, his trivial comedy, as he called it, for serious people. This is the point at which Lady Bracknell interviews Jack Worthy, who has just proposed to her daughter, Gwendolyn, but without Lady Bracknell's permission. And one of her questions to Jack concerns, as you'll remember, the question, the matter of 
education. Says Lady Bracknell, I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? After some hesitation, Jack replied, I, I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am very pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. <laughs> ignorance, ignorance, Mr. Worthing, is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England at any rate, Education produces no effect whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> if it did, it would probably prove a serious danger to the upper classes and would probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. <laughs> Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. Of course, a dramatic overstatement, but one, funnily enough, which actually gives pause for thought especially when one reads and hears of such modest, sometimes embarrassingly modest levels of success alluded to but a moment ago by the Master in attainment, in literacy and numeracy, in nat national examination results, in post-school achievements in the more educationally challenged parts of this country. And for all the efforts of successive ministers for education, whatever their party affiliation, the muddle, as I see it, at the centre seems to continue. But of course, a number of maintained schools standing as beacons of excellence and high achievement, <coughs> but far, far too many providing too sharp a contrast with that. And with all the continuing talk of free schools, a proposition which it seems to me is fraught with complexities, of happiness and well-being classes, of staying on rates, of correctness in the curriculum, of access issues, of university admissions <coughs> issues, of university fees issues, a sense of clear, strong, enduring, thought through direction in the state provision of education in this country seems to continue to elude us. Ms. Sidwell has a task before her. But thank heaven, therefore, for schools such as the Haberdasher schools and their academies. And if I may say in present company particularly, the Haberdasher's Tasks School, which knows its own mind, which works to standards of excellence that the school canton has recently touched upon, academically and in so many other ways. And yes, albeit gifted with intellectually able pupils, which ensures that those who enter through its doors achieve to their potential often very notably so. My own memories of Hams, if I may call it that, remain delightfully rich and varied. Of course, there was that academic glitter among the boys and the staff, the inventiveness, the constant desire to extend, in the best sense, to push the boundaries. But there was also a disarming generosity, thoughtfulness, a sense of care. Nowhere more evident than in those remarkable annual men cat fun days shared with the girls' school, which were every bit as important to a Hams education as was the academic curriculum. I remember, too, the fundraising scheme, one in particular, hatched by a group of sixth form boys, central among whom was one who suffered badly from cystic fibrosis. Reflecting upon his condition and the care he daily received, he wanted, besides pursuing or hoping to pursue a medical career himself, to raise significant funds in support of cystic fibrosis research. The fundraiser plan was to create a paper notepad on every page of which was a different aphorism or quotation or piece of advice, each donated by a personal of national distinction, a politician, an artist, an actor, a celebrity, someone on the national stage. Well, in true Habs style, 
the project was undertaken with real enthusiasm and with sights set high. Quentin Blake was persuaded to provide the cover illustration. I have it here, 10 years on. And major national figures were only too happy to contribute. And they are here, some in a serious mode, some in less, less serious uh, attitude. I think my own favorite quotation offering came from the late Lord Callaghan. It was simple. It was telling. It read as follows. And it's here for you to read. A tip for the over 80s. Never put your socks on standing up. <laughs> <laughs> My personal problem is that I've been able to identify with that for the last 20 years. <laughs> well, the book was a great success. It raised quite a lot of money, and I still enjoy turning its pages. And also, reflecting on its genesis a decade or more ago, relishing the fact that within a context of high academic performance, the heart of the Habs community remained every bit as important as its head. <laughs> <laughs>